All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home, and so thank you so, so much for tuning in on YouTube. We really appreciate you joining us today. And again, if you have joined us before, we are doing five to eight sessions every single day with amazing scientists, explorers, and facilities around the world. No registration, sign up required, and free for all. And they live on YouTube after the fact, so you can tune in for any of your favorite speakers again. But today, we are all joined live at our earliest one so far, nine in the morning uh, Eastern time, by Dr. Jordan Malam. So he is a paleontologist at the Canadian Museum of Nature, and he's going to explore a little bit about what it means to go dig up dinosaur fossils, process dinosaur fossils, and explain a little on the wonderful and wide world of dinosaurs generally. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Jordan, and take it away. I'm glad to be here again, Jesse. Thank you for having me. All right, let me see if I can get this going again here. It's always a learning experience trying to figure out technology. You see that okay? Got your slide deck on the left, your main slide in the middle. And when you're in presenter mode, it'll, there we go, perfect, yeah. go for it. All right, you think I'd done this maybe once before. <laughs> All right, well, uh, again, Jesse, thank you for having me. Thanks to everyone for watching. Um, I, 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 this is probably one of the most common questions I'm asked is, what is it like to be a paleontologist? What do you do on a on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, a lot of people think of paleontologists, they'll think of like, you know, Indiana Jones or, or Alan Grant from Jurassic Park and we're, you know, having adventures and we're being chased by dinosaurs or, or what have you. That, that is obviously not what I do, um, but certainly, uh, it is an adventure, I guess. And, and uh, so I'm happy to share today sort of what do I do on a daily basis? And obviously in the, these times of COVID-19, things are a little different. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mention that uh, as we go along where, where things have changed. Uh, I'm based out of Ottawa in Canada. Uh, I work at the Canadian Museum of Nature. And you can see, uh, you can see the museum here. This is a picture of our, our downtown uh, display building uh, in downtown Ottawa. Um, I grew up in Ottawa um, and I volunteered at the museum and I visited the museum uh, as a kid. This is a, a picture of me. That's me on the left there uh, with, with one of my friends and my sister. Um, we've got these great, this great display of, um, of mammoths. Uh, I believe they're, they're wood carved mammoths out on the front lawn. And they've been moved around over the years, but they're, they're still there today on the lawn. Um, and this is a picture of me, I don't know what, grade grade one or so, I would guess. Um, so all this is to say, I, I grew up going to this museum. And so to be able to work at the museum where I, where I grew up is just fantastic. It, it blows my mind. Um, on my way to becoming a paleontologist, I was sort of spurred on, not just from visiting the museum over the years, but also by movies like Jurassic Park. I was lucky enough to see that in theaters when I was 11. Uh, I remember coming home and thinking, boy, I want to be a paleontologist now. <laughs> and also uh, finding my first fossils uh, in the Ottawa area, um, like uh, these crinoids here, which, which are, you can still find them uh, at the bottom of the sea today. Um, not a lot of dinosaurs in the Ottawa area. In fact, there are no dinosaur fossils, but um, certainly we find, do find a lot of these ancient sea creatures. Um, and so I used to find these uh, when I'd visit like the Bonnachere Caves here uh, in the Ottawa area uh, when I was younger. And that, that was also very inspiring for me. Um, as, I, as I grew up, as I, uh, I, I went to university in Ottawa, specifically Carleton University is where I did my undergraduate uh, studies. Um, that university had just started this new paleontology program at the time. Um, so I was lucky enough to, to stream in through there after I finished high school. And then did, I did my PhD uh, at the University of Calgary. Um, and you can see a picture of me and a number of my, my friends there as we were graduate students. And I'm happy to say that many of them have now gone on to get jobs in paleontology as well, which is it's really heartening to see, you know, you see uh, your, your friend's success. Uh, and so now, as I mentioned, I, I work at the museum here in Ottawa, and mainly what I study are, are herbivorous dinosaurs, horned dinosaurs, um, duck-billed hadrosaurs, uh, these armored ankylosaurs that you can see here. 
And I'm interested in their ecology. So what did they eat? I'm interested uh, also in their evolution. How are they related to one another? Um, this is a beautiful uh, digital painting by a friend of mine, uh, Julius Chitney. Probably my favorite piece of, of paleo art. I, I love the colors there. I, I wish I were in that painting right now, in fact. <laughs> um, the building that I work out of at the museum uh, is, is not the building I showed you earlier. That's our downtown uh, exhib exhibition building. But I work out of our collections and research building, uh, also called the Natural History Campus, which is across the river in Gatineau, Quebec. Uh, that's where my office is. Although I'm not there anymore. I'm working from home these days, like everyone else, I would imagine, just about. Um, so you can see this is my office now. Um, I'm keeping busy uh, transcribing old field notes these days. I am uh, I'm looking at stuff under the microscope that I have in my office here. I'm, I'm working with my students. So all, all kinds of things keep me busy here. But normally I would be in this building that you see in, in this picture right now. Um, I also do field work. Uh, that's a big part of what I do. So uh, if I'm not in my lab uh, or my office, I'm usually in the field, um, uh, usually about a month of the year. Um, I do a lot of field work uh, in Alberta and Saskatchewan right now. Um, and so some of these photos that you're seeing here are of my crew and I digging up, you know, dinosaur skulls. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is a dinosaur footprint that we found here uh, not too long ago. We've collected turtles. We've collected, you know, claws and teeth that are always fun to find. Um, right now, I'm planning for field work in June and July, as I was just mentioning to Jesse earlier. Uh, the issue right now is I don't know if, whether I'll be allowed to travel on time. So, you know, this whole COVID-19 thing is really messing up everyone's plans, but we're going to roll with the punches and hopefully come later in the summer, I'll be able to get out and uh, get digging. I, I, I'm anxious to get outside. <laughs> One of the things I've been working on these last several years is, uh, is a bone bed or a, a graveyard, basically, of thousands of these horned dinosaurs that we call Centrosaurus. Um, it's a neat part of the bone bed that I'm working in right now. There seems to be a lot of uh, semi-articulated skeletons, that is to say skeletons that are, are put together. Usually when we find these bone beds, these mass death accumulations, we get all these bones mixed in together and all the skeletons are broken up. Here all the skeletons are, are, are still put together, which makes this bone bed really interesting. Uh, I also recently collected uh, the skull of a, another horned dinosaur called Chasmosaurus, and there's my assistant Margaret there. Uh, who helped me collect it, among others. Um, she's standing in front of the skull and it's kind of hard to see. So I've got this video here that hopefully you'll see. This is what the skull looks like. And you can see it being superimposed here over, over the, the ground there. So hopefully, oh, my kids are coming to say bye to me. See you, sweetie. <laughs> Have a good day. Sorry, yeah, we're all dealing with that. <laughs> hey, it's great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I also have two kids, yeah. Um, so you can see uh, the skull in the ground here, and, and we're, we're still just finishing preparing that today. Um, we collected that with a, uh, with a helicopter, and so I put together a little video here to show you what that lift looked like. I'll try and, I'll try and narrate over it here. So uh, this is uh, Scott, my assistant. We're on our way out to the site where we found the skull. This is the Badlands on the South Saskatchewan River in Alberta. Sort of a lay of the land I there. I think this batch is going to go out fast. This even feels warm. This, this, this is warm. Darren and Sean here helping me collect the skull. So We're creating a jacket to, to collect it with. Yeah, it's going off really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to turn the sound on the video down a little bit. <clears throat> so there we are making a field jacket just to protect the skull uh, and keep it intact uh, as we use the helicopter to lift it away. Uh, this is Shang digging a hole that we can flip. We're, we're going to lay uh, the cargo net for the lift in this hole, and then we're going to flip the skull block into the cargo net. So there you can see it in place there. And this is the net that's going to hold the fossil as we lift it with a helicopter. 
So that thing weighed, I think it was 1600 pounds. So it was not light. We could not get it out of the Badlands on our own. Um, it's a very remote area where we are very steep hills, as you can see there. And so here comes the helicopter to help us do the lift. I'm going to turn it down again a little bit here. That's me uh, hitching that thing onto the helicopter, telling it to take off. This happened, I guess it was 2017 we did the lift. So that was a few years ago now, and we're just finishing preparation on this fossil now. So you can see it, it takes a, a couple of years at least to, to manage big projects like this. We got, we loaded the, the helicopter up with a GoPro camera. So you can kind of see what they saw. This is the helicopter landing in the field nearby. We had a television crew there that day. You can see, see them over there filming, which was pretty cool. We got a bit of media attention. I had a lot of help, uh, a lot of help managing this, uh, including I'll give a shout out to LR Helicopters. They did the lift for us for free. So I like to give them as much promotion as I can. They're based out of Calgary. They were a huge help. And this is the, this is the skull coming back to my museum here in Ottawa, um, ready to be uh, worked on, to be prepared and, and uh, sort of delivered from its final grave uh, encased in rock and burlap and plaster here. I think that's the end of the video there. Yep. So as I said, we got a we got a bit of media attention when we did this too. So we were on, you know, CTV news and CBC news and we made the I think we were the top story of the Medicine Hat news that year too, as I recall. So yeah, big win. Number one story Medicine Hat news. Big shout out to them. Uh, so we thank everyone for covering that. It was, uh, it was nice to get that attention for sure. And this is just a, a, a picture of the skull as it looks. Uh, actually, as it looked about a year ago, um, we've, we've done a lot more work on the other side now too. So you can see, hopefully you can see my cursor, but right in about the middle of the picture there, that round circle is what we call the orbit or the eye socket. The snout is moving off to the left here and the frill is going off to the right. Unfortunately, we're missing a little bit of the back of the frill. And you can see one of the, the brow horns over. The other brow horns broken off. We're gonna glue that on any day now when we, when we get back to collections to our prep lab. When I, uh, another thing I do besides field work is I do a lot of, um, I, I do a lot of um, um, advising, scientific advisory work for things like, uh, books. You can see there's a book in the middle that I advised on. What if you had T-Rex teeth? Uh, I do a lot of interviews with podcasts or on TV. Uh, Canada Post in the upper left there did a stamp series a number of years ago of dinosaurs uh, and other prehistoric animals. So um, I managed to work with my, again, my friend Julius, that paleo artist that I mentioned earlier, worked with him in designing these stamps and they turned out fantastic. So um, that's a lot of fun just doing that scientific advisory work as well. I'm also an adjunct professor at the university in town here, or one of them anyways, uh, Carleton University. So I have a number of graduate and undergraduate students who uh, do research with me, who come out to the field with me, uh, and, and we publish research together. Um, so I've been doing this now for maybe three years, um, and it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've learned a lot from my students. Hopefully they've learned a lot from me too. Uh, we, we certainly learn from each other. And um, um, it's, it's a real pleasure to sort of uh, see things come full circle, you know, where, whereas I was a student not too long ago, 10 years ago, I'm now bringing my own students through the system too, which is really cool. Probably the, the, the number one thing I do, certainly my, among my favorite things to do is, is original research on dinosaurs. And that's really sort of the bread and butter of what I do. I, my, my technical position at the museum is a research scientist. So I get paid to, to generate original research on dinosaurs. Um, one, this is a paper I published not, uh, well, four years ago now describing a new species of horned dinosaur called uh, Spiclipius shiporum. Um, so you can see uh, a reconstruction of that animal on the right here by a good friend of mine, Mike Skrepnik. And I've got a video here of, of the skull. Um, 
as it looks in the round, it's amazing horned dinosaur, a relative of, of Triceratops. We know it's a new species from the, from the interesting little hornlets that come off the back of the frill there. Um, there's nothing alive, or uh, there's definitely nothing alive like it today, but there was, there was nothing alive like it uh, at the time either, 76 million years ago. So uh, I was lucky enough to be in, uh, involved in the project describing this new horned dinosaur, which is now on display at our museum in Ottawa. You can go and see it for yourself. Very cool. I also did some more research looking at uh, these armored ankylosaurs. There was a, it's been noted for a long time that when, when they're found in the fossil record, usually they're, they're flipped upside down. And so I did a project uh, a couple of years ago now looking at why that is in collaboration with some uh, folks uh, at the Tyrrell Museum in Drumheller and based uh, out of Georgia as well, some armadillo ecologists. And uh, long story short, we found that these ankylosaurs are found upside down in the fossil record because when they died, their carcasses would get washed into rivers and stream channels. And uh, as their bodies decayed, they would bloat up. And their bellies, which are full of air, full of gas, would want to naturally flip upside down. And their armored backs, which were weighed down by all this armor would want to would also want to rotate in the water so this would have the effect of of um, flipping the animal upside down where they would be buried uh, and become part of the fossil record so that was a cool little uh, project there oh i should say it was also there's one of my collaborators there uh, don henderson at the tyrell museum um, this research was part of a, a recent documentary on on cbc um, so it was, it was cool to see my research uh, uh, featured, or our research, I should say, featured uh, on that documentary. Um, and last slide here, um, as I said, I've got students uh, coming in now of my own. This is a project I worked on with a student of mine named uh, Bridget Christensen as part of her undergraduate thesis. Um, we've got a, a number of, in fact, we have Canada's uh, first dinosaurs in our collections here in Ottawa, but a lot of that material has been forgotten about. This is material that was collected in the 1870s and 1880s. And uh, although it was collected so early on, and it's, it's, a, it's really a part of our, our heritage uh, here in Canada, it was, none of the material was ever described or really ever looked at. And so I tasked my student Bridget here to um, to help describe some of this material and illustrate it for the first time. And so this paper that we worked on is gonna be coming out in a journal uh, called Earth Sciences History, probably in the next month or so. It just went to press. So I'm really looking forward to sort of sharing this with the world, a, a review of the history of Canada's early uh, dinosaur collections, really dating back to the cowboy days, which is, it, it's a really cool story. So stay tuned for that. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll end there. That's sort of a taste of what I do. And uh, I'll be happy to open it up to, to questions and I'll, I'll throw to Jesse. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for that awesome presentation, Jordan. Uh, while you were telling us all about your, your fantastic work, uh, the Canadian Museum of Nature also sent along some really cool dinosaur coloring pages. So I've linked those in the YouTube chat bar. If you guys want to do some activities at home, uh, check that out and then send it to us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. But yes, we've got people tuning in from all across Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Brazil, which we haven't had a Brazil this month so far, so that's exciting. So welcome in from Brazil uh, to the student. If you guys have questions, just type them in the chat bar, and I'll pass along as many as I can. But I'm going to start with one that I know is inevitably coming, Jordan, and that is if you're at home and you're five years old, like a lot of our people tuning in today, what are some things that I can do to get your job? Like, how can I become a paleontologist? Well, that's a good question. Um, the great thing about paleontology now is there are many ways of becoming involved. Um, paleontology traditionally is, is a marriage between uh, two fields, namely biology and, and geology. And so traditionally, many people have entered the fields via one of those two routes. Um, my background, I mentioned I went to Carleton University, I was in a geology program there, and I was in a biology program um, uh, at the University of Calgary. But, you know, increasingly in science, not just in paleontology, we're applying 
new methods. You know, we're looking for for DNA and dinosaur fossils now. So, you know, there is aspects of uh, biochemistry that that are coming into play. We're doing a lot of computer modeling, trying to model what these animals looked like in life, how they moved, um, and so we take people of all various backgrounds um, and, and try to apply their methods in, in reconstructing dinosaurs. But to, maybe to take a step back quickly, you need to be, you need to stay in school, you know? You, so uh, typically a good solid science background in high school uh, and even in university um, um, will work well in your favor. Uh, to do my job, I'm a, I'm a research scientist most research scientists tend to have a PhD. So um, I'd recommend kind of going that route, but not all, not all people who work in paleontology are research scientists or have PhDs. Uh, a lot of us teach, a lot of us do um, fossil preparation work. Uh, I showed a lot off some pretty cool dinosaur art earlier as well. And so um, there, there's all kinds of different ways of becoming involved in paleontology that don't just involve having a a PhD in, in doing research. Um, so lots of ways in the, in the door, yeah. Very cool, thanks so much, Jordan. All right, Carolyn in Barrie, Ontario wants to know, where is the largest concentration of dinosaur fossils in Canada and why? That's an easy one. Um, the largest concentration by far and away uh, is in Alberta. Um, I'll preface this by saying that we do find dinosaurs all across Canada. There are dinosaurs out in the Maritimes. We're finding dinosaurs in BC increasingly. There are dinosaurs up north in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories. Um, um, but by far the largest collections in Alberta. And there are a few different reasons for that. Um, most of the dinosaurs we find in Alberta date to between about 75 and 65 uh, million years ago, 66 thereabouts. And at that time, North America was inundated by a shallow seaway that ran uh, uh, from the Arctic Ocean down to the, the, um, the Gulf of Mexico. And dinosaurs in Alberta at the time lived along the shoreline of that seaway. And so it was a low lying coastal area. Um, and at the time, the Rocky Mountains were still relatively young and uplifting. And so as those mountains were growing, they were shedding sediment down the streams that flowed into the seaway nearby. And dinosaurs were, were caught right in the middle of that action. So there's a source of water nearby in, in the seaway. There's, a, there's an abundant source of sediment coming down from those young, uplifting Rocky Mountains. And where you've got water and sediment, you've got a great preservational area in which to bury any you know, dead animals that might be lying on the surface. So we just had this like perfect storm of circumstances in Alberta at the time. Again, 70, 75 to 66 million years ago, thereabouts uh, for preserving dinosaurs. Super cool. And I love how much you focused there on how the world has been so different over the period of time. I mean, thinking of a giant sea in the middle of Canada, something that we can't really think about nowadays, but uh, that's what the geological mindset gives you. Yeah, you know, you go you go to um, Manitoba, for example, at the same time, looking in rocks about 75 million years old, 80 million years old, and you find uh, the marine reptiles. So you don't find dinosaurs, you find underwater uh, sea creatures. Um, so that that's proof positive that 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 area of Canada was inundated at the time. Very neat. All right. Again, we got so many five, like specifically five-year-olds today. So get ready. I'm going to try and take everyone's questions if I can. We'll see if we can get through all these. So Luke in Oshawa, Ontario wants to know, what do these dinosaurs eat? What? Oh boy. That's a big question. Uh, you know, we know of about 1,200 species of dinosaurs so far. That is to say, from the fossil record, right? Um, and, and so think of Think of something like mammals today. That's like asking, what do mammals eat? Well, mammals eat all kinds of different things. Mammals eat plants and meat, and some are carnivores, some are omnivores, uh, some specialize on insects. Dinosaurs were very much the same. You know, we're talking about a big group of animals. Some were likely specializing, some were definitely specializing on meat, some were insect eaters. You know, look at something like a Tyrannosaurus rex. That thing was not 
scarfing down uh, salad. <laughs> it was it was specializing on meat. In fact, it was a bone crush crusher. We know from its teeth that it could crush bone. Whereas if you look at something like um, like a triceratops, triceratops is really weird. Uh, it, they've got these very strict slicing dentitions um, that operated like a pair of, of shears or a pair of scissors. So they were eating very tough food, whatever, whatever it was, probably, you know, leaves and tough, very fibrous plant matter. Um, it was probably not feeding on meat with any regularity. Um, so dinosaurs ran the dietary spectrum the same way that that mammals do today. Some ate meat, some ate plants, some ate insects, uh, you name it. Some ate both. Very cool. Well, we were saying too, before we got started with this presentation, how many species of dinosaur do we know that we've identified in the world? So far, it's about 1,200. Uh, and and the, the number is climbing rapidly because we've got a lot of paleontologists out there today looking in new parts of the world. Um, and so we're finding new things all the time. I, I think the average right now is one new species every two or three weeks, something like that. So, you know, 40 some odd a year thereabouts maybe. Um, yeah. it's, it's impressive. It is, but I mean, just for context for our, our students looking in at home, like there's over 6,000 species of mammal that we know right now that live on earth, never mind the ones that have already gone extinct. So the fact that we're only at 1200 dinosaurs means there's so much more to find. So with questions like what do they eat, it's even going to get broader our understanding. And so I, I always love highlighting that. Yep, absolutely. All right. Uh, so Mason in Sterling, Ontario, a lot of Ontario today. Welcome in guys. Uh, what's the, yes. What's the first fossil you found in the museum? or your first fossil you ever got in the museum, if you know. That I got into my museum? Well, what? so you personally, or as the Museum of Nature itself, like is there any like sort of landmark fossil you guys got that blew everyone's oh, mind? At the Museum of Nature. Um, well, the first fossil ever collected uh, in Canada that was at one point at our museum, but which has now unfortunately been lost to the sands of time. We don't know where it is and or when it went missing, but the first fossil ever collected on Canadian soil that, that came back to a museum was uh, something collected by a guy uh, named uh, George Dawson in 1874 out of what is now uh, Grasslands National Park. He collected some, some duck-billed dinosaur tail vertebrae. And uh, and although we have reports of them, we've even got uh, some old illustrations of them. We don't know where those are anymore. They, they were lost probably a hundred years ago, sadly. Um, but probably one of the most famous fossils at my museum was again, an early find collected in 1884 by a guy by the name of uh, Joseph Tyrrell, who you probably know gave his name to the Tyrrell Museum out in Drumheller, Alberta. He collected the skull of a dinosaur called Albertosaurus. It's a relative of T-Rex. And um, that skull is now at my museum in Ottawa. And it really, it was found uh, in Alberta near Drumheller. And it, it really tipped the world off to the fact that there are cool dinosaurs to be found uh, in the uh, Canadian Badlands. And so um, that really started sort of the, the dinosaur rush uh, here in Canada, leading into the early 1900s. So that's really, I'd say that's at least one of the, the sort of poster children uh, for the for the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa here. Fantastic. What a great story. I love all the dates too. It was a very nerdy story, Jordan. I like it. You know everything, like all the nuances. Uh, <laughs> I'm really into, into sort of the early uh, sort of collecting history of dinosaurs here in Canada. I, I think it's fascinating. So I, I, I know my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously to learn this sort of stuff, you would have had to read books at some point. And so we have a question from a five-year-old in Chicago that wants to know, what are some of your favorite dinosaur books? Now, again, we've got a lot of young kids today. You have kids of your own. When you gave them dinosaur books, is there anything that really jumps out that we can share with kids today? Some of my favorite dinosaur books. Wow. That's a great question. Let me think. If I'm thinking, I have some of my old library behind me here, so maybe I'll even grab some. Grab some. Yeah. And if, yeah, yeah. Them, and if you think of them later too, we can always share them in the YouTube comment section. So, like worst case, if we can't answer this in like a minute or so, we'll share them later so that everyone can check them out at home after the fact. But I love that they're ready right there. Yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna. 
Well, there's so many. There, there's so many. I, I don't have time to poke through them all right now. Uh, one of the first ones I read growing up, well, I've got to bring it into screen here, is uh, something called Digging Dinosaurs by uh, Jack Horner, who um, used to work out of Montana. He's retired now, but uh, I'll give a plug to Jack's book. Um, Jack Horner is the man who famously um, developed this idea that uh, dinosaurs uh, cared for their young. So he found nesting sites of this, this animal here, Myasaura, duckbill dinosaur, uh, in Montana. And he develops this, this idea that uh, Myasaura, meaning good mother lizard, uh, took care of its young uh, while in the nest. So that was a cool book to read when I was younger. Um, kind of a popular level book. I remember, I remember this book here. This is one I, I, I fell in love with, uh, I guess probably around high school age, Predatory Dinosaurs of the World by Gregory Paul. Um, I got into dinosaurs kind of via the artistic route. I was very artistic growing up. I used to love drawing dinosaurs. And uh, Gregory Paul's an amazing dinosaur artist. So I remember uh, the, the book is full, filled with like, well, text <laughs> and also cool uh, reconstruction. So I used to, I used to draw those a lot too. Um, so if you can get your hands on either of those two books, I, I'd highly recommend them. Maybe D Predatory Dinosaurs of the World is a bit technical, um, but it's got cool uh, artwork in it for kids. So I, I recommend those and, you know, countless others. There's so many dinosaur books out there now. Fantastic. And you had highlighted dinosaur art earlier in your presentation. So what I'm going to do in the YouTube chat bar as well is link to that artist so I can share some of his amazing work with kids at home and they can check out some of the stuff he's done. All right. Again, we're getting tons of questions here. I'm going to take a, a few more. Um, and so Delaney uh, wants to know, Delaney in Pennsylvania, by the way, wants to know, why are dinosaurs so big? Oh, that's a that's a common question. It's And it's a hard one to answer because um, there's probably no one reason why dinosaurs got so big. You know, think of the biggest dinosaurs we know of, things like uh, Brachiosaurus and Brontosaurus and Argentinosaurus. These are the big sauropods that we all know and love. Um, how did those ones in particular get so big? Because they were bigger than anything on land today. Um, it helped, number one, that uh, they didn't really chew their food. They had very simple teeth. And so mammals chew their food today, and that takes time to do. That, that takes time to process uh, within the mouth. And so um, dinosaurs did away with that. They Well, I shouldn't say they did away with it. They just never developed a chewing mechanism. So all, the, all these sauropods did was they used their their heads to rake in food all day long and they actually let their stomachs ferment uh, and process the food and they had gizzards like like uh, birds do as well and so the food was processed in the gizzard and then passed along to the stomach and so in so doing they didn't have to spend time chewing their food they could just rake it in all day long and so by eating food constantly you're able to grow very large um, they also use their long necks, probably something like a, a, a vacuum along the landscape. And so they didn't have to move. Um, they, they really didn't have to move their bodies across the landscape to feed. They could feed along large swaths of the landscape just using their long necks. So they were efficient in that way. Uh, we know that their bones were very hollow, uh, very similar to bird bones today. Uh, and so even though they got really big, they wouldn't weigh as much as a mammal that, let's say, was that big because they were full of air sacs and hollows. And so um, there's all these different reasons as to why sauropods in particular uh, could reach the sizes that they did. They were just built unlike uh, anything alive today. So they, they managed to sort of, uh, you know, find these interesting ways into this impressive gigantism that we're familiar with today. Super cool. All right, we're gonna take uh, two more quick questions and then we'll wrap up by finding out where kids can learn even more. So yeah. Quentin Five in Nova Scotia wants to know, what predators would have tried to eat the Chasmosaurus you mentioned? What predators would have tried to eat the Chasmosaurus? Ooh, good question. Uh, Chasmosaurus is probably my, 
one of my favorite horned dinosaurs. So I got to work on it uh, as an undergraduate student. So uh, always love that one. I hate, I hate to think of it that anything would have tried to eat it, but almost certainly um, Chasmosaurus lived in Alberta about 75 million years ago. And at the time, uh, the biggest predator was an animal called uh, Gorgosaurus libratus. Uh, uh, a, a tyrannosaurid related to T-Rex, a little smaller, and uh, that would almost certainly have fed on, on Chasmosaurus. There was another animal around at the time named Displetosaurus, again a big tyrannosaur, even bigger than Albertosaurus. Uh, those two species were probably um, the ones feeding on the horned dinosaurs. Uh, if anything did, they did. So. Gorgosaurus and Displetosaurus. Very cool. Speaking of Gorgosaurus, actually, literally yesterday we did a presentation with the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum, where one of the things they featured as they walked through the museum was Gorgosaurus. If you're keen, check out our YouTube page for that as well. Definitely. Uh, cool museum. All right. Softball question for you from a bunch of people on YouTube, and we'll wrap up with this one. What is your favorite dinosaur? Oh. No pressure. <laughs> favorite dinosaur. Uh, you know, growing up, it was always T-Rex because that's everybody's favorite dinosaur growing up. Um, but uh, I, I, I kind of fell in love with, with horned dinosaurs, especially, you know, come my, my time in university. And so um, I loved Chasmosaurus because I got to work on Chasmosaurus. Um, and I love, uh, uh, well, I, I mentioned the horned dinosaur that I got to help name, uh, Spiclipius. That was a really cool project, and and I really love just the the sort of aesthetics of the skull. So, Chasmosaurus and Spiclipius, I'd say, are probably tied for my number one spot right now. <laughs> Very cool. All right, and so again, we're getting more questions, and we can possibly answer in one of these sessions. So, so Jordan, these kids, when they go home, they finish this session. Other than doing those awesome dinosaur coloring pages, where can they go to learn more about you, about the Museum of Nature, and just get inspired and excited about dinosaurs? Well, I'm, I'm on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, you can follow me there. I'm at uh, Jordan underscore Mallon, J-O-R-D-A-N underscore M-A-L-L-O-N. Uh, so follow me on Twitter. I try and post updates about my research there and my students' research, uh, what we're doing in the, in the fossil preparation lab. And unfortunately, those updates are kind of fewer, fewer and further between now that I'm stuck in my home office. But uh, I, I do have some plans to post some of my research uh, even from home uh, pretty soon as I, I as I get some photos uh, going here of what I'm working on. Uh, also uh, at the museum, uh, the website is nature.ca. Um, so um, you can go there now, as I say, as we're all stuck inside, the museum's got all kinds of online activities posted that you can look at, um, uh, activities that you can do from home. Um, We've got, uh, I mentioned Spiclipius earlier, this horned dinosaur, the model that I showed, you can manipulate uh, that thing on uh, nature.ca to see what it looked like in the round, sort of a virtual museum that you can visit uh, from your, your basement as well. <laughs> um, so between those two things, nature.ca and my Twitter account, those are probably the best ways of, of sort of seeing what I'm up to. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much for an awesome presentation, Jordan. And before we wrap up as well, I want to highlight for everyone tuning in at home, we've got sessions with quantum physicists, with astrophysicists, with the Toucan Rescue Ranch in, in Costa Rica, Ripley's Aquarium of Canada, and with a NASA engineer for the rest of the day. So it's a packed day. If you want to check out our YouTube channel, keep coming in. We really appreciate you watching. Jordan, that was fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us today. And we really appreciate you sharing all your love of dinosaurs with us. It's been a, a fun way to start the day. So thanks for having me, Jesse. Anytime, come on back and have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.